Blog Talk Radio. <laughs> Quantum Healing with Candace. I'm your host, Candace Craw Goldman. This program was created to assist humans in this rapidly changing world while it is expanding into new realms and new ways of thinking and being. And it is based on the foundation of the late, great Dolores Cannon's work and our continued contact with her from beyond the veil. So thank you, Dolores, for continuing to encourage us to explore new directions. Also, big thanks to Greg Prescott and Michelle Walling at In5D.com for making this show possible. Greg and Michelle, I love you more and more every day. I'd like to take a moment to thank all of the wonderful supporters of this show and this work and all of my In5D friends and my New Earth Journey friends my Facebook friends, QHHT practitioners, and clients. And with humanity's new understanding and acceptance of the quantum world and the role that consciousness plays in shaping both our individual Alexa, stop. (laughs) Our Alexa decided to start playing music there. We had to tell her to stop. We have plenty of subject material for this show. I'm a full-time practitioner of Dolores' hypnosis method and had the honor and privilege of working with and alongside of her for several years. You can find out more about my practice of quantum healing and my consulting and coaching services at newearthjourney.com. I'd like to mention that I'm offering my own new quantum healing process that's available remotely. Call or email me about how we can create your very own personalized and unique to you quantum healing meditation process. And lastly, before we get started tonight, for those of you looking for a practitioner of Dolores' method of quantum healing, or for those of you who've trained with Dolores in the past, you may find wonderful practitioners and resources for practitioners of all kinds at DoloresCannonQHHT.com. This show supports those who are dedicated practitioners of Dolores Cannon's method. Also, if you'd like to participate in the show tonight, please call in the U.S. 646-716-8890. That number again, 646-716-8890. So tonight is March 18th, 2016, and the topic of the show is when healers get sick. But before we start talking about all of that, I'd like to now welcome my dear friend and co-host, colleague, and fellow quantum healing practitioner, Mary M. Truitt. Hi, Mary. Hi, Candice. How are you today? I am so much better, and it's no secret to many of you and and my Facebook friends, I think, that one of the reasons we're doing this show is because I have been a little under the weather. Now, how about you? You've been very well this year of 2016? I have been. I'm a little bit scared to say it because I'm going to find some wood. (laughs) Yes, I have been very well. Thank you. (laughs) Well, that's, that's really, really wonderful. So, 
we're gathering today to talk about what it is that might be happening. You know, a lot of people are talking about stargates and astral um, alignments and whether or not it's ascension symptoms or cosmic energies or or what. There's all kinds of things that could be happening. We've had some people talk about psychic burnout in our community and and we really want to explore what's going on when when healers face their own health challenges. And I wanted to start by kind of defining something that we all seem to talk about a little bit, and that's the uh, the wounded healer archetype. And this was developed by Carl Jung, who drew upon the myth of Chiron to explain the one who is wounded becomes capable of healing and helping others when he realizes that the wound he carries is universal. So this is a Greek myth. You know, Chiron was the centaur who was half man and half horse and the progeny of Zeus, and he was wounded by an arrow of um, Heracles' bow. And since he was a god and immortal, he didn't die because of the arrow. But nonetheless, he was condemned to journey through the rest of his days in excruciating pain due to the severe woundedness. And so because he had no choice but to suffer the ache that now became part of his identity, he was resigned to living with this pain. And so it's this, this resignation, you know, this acceptance that brought with it a sense of patience with the difficulty, which resulted in a great ability to understand and connect and empathize with the past of others. So this this pain, you know, the experience of being wounded and um, having to deal with this misery became a doorway to intimacy with other people's pain, and it led to a deep compassion. And Mary, a lot of our fellow practitioners have come to this healing method through their own pain and challenges, haven't they? Absolutely. Um, one of the things that I don't know if you want me to start, but there's, you bet. So, there's so much on this topic of um, the idea of the wounded healer. Um, you know, I'm also thinking of the Judeo-Christian religion in tradition in which um, Jacob um, wrestles with the angel and receives a wound on his hip and the wrestling and the wound actually he cha- they changed his name to Israel which i think means to wrestle with god and this idea of the wound as the doorway as you said which is such a perfect perfect um symbol or i often think of the threshold to um to some kind of transformation or understanding um and that ability to see that wound as both personal and universal is something that I see in almost not only every client who comes to see me, but also in other people who do this work. It it seems to be almost an initiation, and often at a very young age, there's an initiatory um, wound that becomes a teacher. Yes, and, you know, I think to so many of our amazing friends and colleagues who are carrying on Dolores' work, who had either a session or some sort of profound experience that brought them to, to this work. And now they've sort of found their path and they're helping others. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's all about how we view illness and it's all about, I think we're sort of laying the foundation here for our conversation. So I guess I will just begin by saying that I think that over the years I've come to see illness as something very different from what I saw it as when I was a child, of course. Um, so, I mean, for our purposes, how would you, how would we define illness? Let's think about it. Disease, illness, um, we can see it from so many different um, points of view. And I think it's either, you know, our teacher – or it's our enemy. You know, we kind of, a lot of times when people get, especially in the Western tradition, it's as if you've been visited by some kind of evil spirit or devil. Like, why did I get sick? There's sort of this this sort of 
surprise and guffaw, like, ooh, how could I have gotten that? And I think another approach, which is the one that we take, which is how did I attract that to myself? How did I create that? And Mm -hmm. those two are very different points of view, and they really guide how we then address this particular dis-ease within our body. Do we treat this Mm -hmm. guest as, as a as an unwelcome guest or as someone that we invite to come in and and talk to and listen to and learn from. Yes, and if you look at the word itself, and and many in our community put that hyphen in there, you know, D-I-S hyphen E's, the dis-E's, you know, what is it that is, um, you know, affecting your ease? And I, I think very often, how, how do you feel about this, Mary, when a lot of people talk about particular cancer, you know, and the ribbons and everything, and they keep talking about cancer and battling, you know, they put up such a fight, they put up such a struggle, you know, the battle with cancer. And I've been gently saying to anybody who's open enough to hear it, that cancer needs to be understood, not fought. Mm-hmm. You know, I think there, I I completely agree with you. And I think that as I was reminded the other day of someone who's very close to me has a very serious autoimmune disease, which he deals with really pretty much on a daily basis. And he called me up the other day, you know, really struggling with feeling just terrible. And I said, oh, let's try this and let's try that. And both things were a little bit, you know, woo-woo, a little bit, you know, the way we see things. And he said, do you have any idea how irritating it is to hear that you want me to heal my soul and my spirit when I feel so sick I can hardly get out of bed? (laughs) So I think we have to be very sort of careful about this. It's easy when we're sitting in a healthy body and we work in this world to – to give people advice about how they might want to search, you know, their their life and their psyche for kind of what might have created this. Um, and so we have to be very careful. But at the same time, it's very important to also hold that space open for them that there's a possibility that there's another way to look at this aside from just I'm being attacked. Right. And it has to do with um, that paradox. And one of, one of the... Uh, teachers out there that I think talks about this in the best way is actually um, Daryl Anka, who uh, channels Bashar, and he talks about, you know, this paradox of, he does it brilliantly, about if, you know, you would you would prefer a different reality or you would prefer a different way of being. And one of the very first and best steps that you can take if you would prefer to be experiencing something different paradoxically is to absolutely accept exactly what's happening to you right now and not be in resistance. And that's hard for people, isn't it? Well, I think, I think it's really hard because, you know, we might be able to, you know, with our mind say, okay, I get it. But then when your body is in pain and you feel nauseated and worn out and exhausted and you can't do anything, it's really hard to embrace that. Um, You know, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with people who work in in healing arts, whether it's acupuncture or, you know, um, energy work or QHHT or whatever, who, who are happy to sit in a great space with their clients saying, why don't we look at it this way or why don't we do this or try that? But then the minute it happens to them, (laughs) the first part is they know all the stuff they're supposed to do. They know the approach they're supposed to have, but they're like, screw that. I just feel sick. I feel sorry for myself. (laughs) And that's where, you know, this, this conversation that you wanted to have tonight to me is so, is so spot on because, it's really where the rubber meets the road. You know, when people who work in the healing arts themselves get sick, and that's when we're really, really tested. Because it's true, embrace, isn't it? Can we embrace the advice that we give others? Can we say, oh, this is, this is a lesson, this is something I created. <laughs> this, you know, it's like, forget it. I'm taking a couple of Advil and I'm, you know, whatever. It's just... It can be very challenging. 
the thing that I I find um, humorous, and and one of the main reasons why I really wanted to do this show, is um, there seems to be a thing with healers. They don't want they don't want anyone to know. You know, if if you want clients or you want to talk to people about healing, there's some sort of uh, idea that you should be healthy and perfect uh, at all times. And I know that we have colleagues, you know, some of whom have the challenge of some very serious conditions. And, and we've spoken on, you know, Dolores's original support forum. We've, we've talked about some of this, uh, you know, are they capable of helping others when they're having their own challenges like this? And, and I say, absolutely. I mean, do we, do, do you, does the, does the public in general question the ability of a doctor when a medical, traditional medical doctor gets some sort of illness? I, I think that for some reason, and you know, you tell me, but for some reason, those in the alternative community, um, we, we tend to be more embarrassed or tend to want to hide or tend to be questioned more about our own health than even those in the traditional medical profession when, when they have health challenges. And I'm wondering, why is that? You know, it's interesting because as you were talking, I began to think about, you know, when we hear the news that somebody has cancer or somebody has come down with some, some illness, there is, there is a moment, I think, as a, as a society where we somewhat – shun that person, and I'm not talking about me necessarily, but there's a moment of fear of going, wow, glad that's not me, or wow, Mm -hmm. that's kind of gross, or that's kind of, you know, there is that moment. It's it's shameful. It's, It's a shameful thing, but we tend to isolate. You know, I've noticed over and over again that when someone in a smallish community comes down with really a, a life-threatening disease or a terminal disease, people are either deeply attracted to it and want to become the hero of helping them and making promises and making casseroles and doing all these things, almost magical thinking, like if I can help this person enough, you know, it won't happen to me. Um, mm-hmm. There's a kind of a helping. And then there are others who just shy away instantly. They just are out of fear. And so illness, I think, as something, as a phenomenon in our society, is still very, um, you know, it's, it's, there's a kind of a strange shunning of it. And I think that's reflected often in, in Western medicine where if you go to a, a, a regular Western doctor or to a hospital, the entire purpose behind most of the medicine is to just make the symptoms go away so we don't have to think about it anymore. If you have a headache, take pills. If you have a whatever you have, just make it go away. And, you know, this brings me to to the idea of curing versus healing because you can certainly cure many things. You can cure a headache by taking an Advil. You can cure, um, you know, rheumatism sometimes by making, you know, taking something that unswells the limb. But have you cured it on a soul level? you know, making the symptoms go away. We really have, I think, a tendency as a society to just want things to go away so we don't have to look at them anymore. And the whole purpose of true healing and the wound that we talked about, whether it's Jacob or Chiron, is to be able to, to sit with that wound and look at it and say, okay, this has happened to me. I'm gonna. I'm going to spend some time with this now. And as you said about cancer, to treat it as something that has to have time spent with it. Okay, here you are. Come sit at the table. Let's talk. And those are two very different paradigms in terms of looking at illness. They really are. You know, it, it's not in the too distant past where uh, people didn't talk about cancer. You know, it was like a hush hush, a secret thing. So, you know, in some ways we have uh, grown and, and, and had some sort of acceptance. But, yes, it's interesting the, the dual reaction that, that people have to illness and to, and to other challenges. And what, of course, we have begun to learn, and, and Louise Hay, of course, is also, um, you know, must be mentioned here, 
is that when you consider whatever it is that you are being faced with, you get a lot of clues, right? Clues in the body, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so So tell tell me... Louise Hay, for those of you who may not be aware, she was one of the pioneers of talking about the uh, the fact that the the type of challenge, the you know the the place in your body that you are finding difficulty with, or um, you know um, uncomfortable feelings, or pain, or or dis ease, can give you a clue to what might be going on, and. And it's a very good place to begin. But, I, you know, even from the get-go before, you know, even stating some examples, what I'd like to say is it's, it's certainly not comprehensive and always uh, the case. Um, you know, for instance, they would say, or Louise might say, if, if you have something going on with your eyes, for example, um, you may not want to be looking at something. You may be closing your eyes to some sort of situation. You may not want to have an honest look about something that's going on with your life. So that is kind of a standard go-to first way of thinking about what's going on um, in your life and why you may be having that challenge. But I will never, ever forget, and I know my husband's listening uh, to the show, so Tom, you were with me. Do you remember when we were in Dolores Cannon's class and she was regressing this young man who had um this was this was a time when she was still doing the live demonstrations in her class and this young man had one eye that was a lazy eye and i actually um uh, here i'll admit it here on national radio i actually have a lazy eye myself it's not all the time but i do have a lazy eye myself so this was very interesting to me and um So if you were to look at this topic in that way, well, what is it that he doesn't want to look at? But what happened was he immediately went back into time into um, a a royal family. You know, I believe it was Elizabeth's court or something, you know, the royal family where he was. It was Queen Elizabeth. I was at that session when that happened, when he had his one eye. I was there. (laughs) That's just so amazing. I remember that so well because you know what what his issue with his eye you know it didn't have anything to do with sort of this standard answer of there was something in his life he didn't want to look at it literally was a past life carryover where he do you remember what he said slept with one I, eye I open to, i had to sleep with one eye open cuz he was scared of spies he was a <laughs> he was a psychic who helped queen elizabeth and they began to, they wanted to kill him because he had too much power. And so he had to sleep with one eye open. And there, isn't, that, isn't that just amazing? And he'd always had a, a, a fondness and an attraction for that time period in this lifetime. But I, I mentioned that just as an example of you can, um, when you're looking at your own challenge or, or a loved one's challenge or whatever, it, it's not a bad thing to sort of, you know, take the, the Louise Hay sort of look at something and, and, and begin to ask some questions about your life or whatever. But it's, it's not for sure. You know, you don't really know. And, and, and some of that's what we find out sometimes in our quantum healing sessions is we find out the exact reason for some of these things that, that may not be, um, uh, guessed at at the surface but uh, well, and also, you know some of the go ahead oh sorry of course um Dolores um did did find that that things that happen on the left side of the body happen are are perhaps stemming from past lives or other lifetimes and things on the right side of the body have to do with this lifetime that we're in now uh, do you know, Mary, when I first took Dolores' class in 2008, I remember saying this perhaps a little too loudly, but I remember actually when she said that in class, I turned to my seatmate and I said, that was worth the price of the um, of the class right there because my issues that I had had and that I had brought 
you know, in hopes of, of healing, I've even started to call it my left disease because everything was happening on my left. Everything. It was all on the left side. <laughs> wow. That's interesting. It's it really, really interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think the issue of the body, I mean, just to kind of go back to where we began in this conversation, I think the um, ownership of the body is a is just a fascinating part of our struggle as a human. Um, I, I, I always, um, you know, I teach literature, and one of the books that I love to teach is Kafka's Metamorphosis or Transformation because, of course, it's about a young man who wakes up one morning and he's a beetle instead of a human being. And his struggles to try to make his body work while inside he's still the same profound person He's totally human, but he has this body that has all these needs and all these, you know, broken parts and all these funny little appetites that he has to serve, and yet he's he's really cut off from it in some way because inside he's such a different person. And I think, you know, each of us struggle with that at a certain point, you know, especially when we go through adolescence and we really are aware of our body, so hyper aware of it, we begin to have to claim ownership of this strange body that does things we don't control it grows hair in places we might not have thought it were <laughs> possible to grow hair it you know it, it kind of becomes an animal and I think if you're a woman especially you know you have the privilege of going through so many seasons in your body whether it's menstruation or pregnancy or pregnancy loss or you know breastfeeding or whatever um, I always think it's a huge pre- privilege to to go through those things, but what comes with it is, wow, a lot of relationship to body. And um, I think the female and male experiences are very different in that. But I think we all come to that. And, and, And illness and disease create almost a third part of that. So you have your mind, spirit, heart, and then you have the body, and then you have this other visitor that can show up and create a communication between your spirit and your body, right? It Mm -hmm. forces you to have a conversation with your body. You know, those are such really, really great thoughts, and I love the um, the vision of you standing in front of your students talking about Kafka. Just thank you for that. That That was a gift. I love it. You know, one of the things that I talk to my clients about is the idea of your your body you know, possibly thinking of your body as um, as a partner. A lot of people are so angry at their bodies because they're not healthy and they're not um, vibrant and they aren't doing what they want. So some of their internal dialogue is a constant battle with their bodies. And yep. Sometimes when I hear people talk about this, I'll look at them, and especially if I've found that they have children or pets, and pets especially, because pets seem to be very, very, um, you know, innocent, um, usually in in people's lives. And what I'll say is I'll say, would you ever talk to your dog like that if it was sick or your cat or your horse or whatever? And they get this this look on their face, and they would, they say, no, why, you know, this, why would I ever do that to this, this innocent animal? And, and I give them the idea to consider perhaps that their body is much like that, that it's, that it's this other thing, you know, that their spirit is in partnership or is inhabiting the body, but it's not you. It's not who you are. And if you are, especially with your internal dialogue, constantly fretting and being angry and upset and negative about what's going on, well, does that encourage health and healing and balance and ease yeah not so much right <laughs> I mean, you, right one of the things is learning to be kind to your body as it serves your heart and mind and spirit um you know one of the things i think about a lot and you know going back to the topic of um the idea that when the healers get sick is about 
God, 15 years ago, um, I was just exhausted and burnt out. And, you know, I have five children, and it's kind of a lot of children to have, actually, I think. I don't know how many (laughs) children everybody else has. But, you know, you can kind of, as a mother, get a little bit burnt out sometimes. And I... At one point, a friend of my, a wonderful friend of mine gave me a present, which was to go to a retreat for um, four nights up at Kerpalu in Stockbridge. And it's a wonderful place, and I'd never been there before. And I went there for four nights, and I basically dragged myself across the threshold and collapsed in my bedroom and threw myself at the mercy of all the healers there. And one of the... Um, one of the the people there who did massage said, you know, what's going on with you? And I said, I feel as if I'm a tube of toothpaste that's just (laughs) squeezed out every last little tiny drop and there's nothing left for me. And she kind of laughed, which is a great response, of course. And she said, oh, just get up on the table. And you know, she she did this amazing thing, which was she went through each of my chakras. And at one point when she got to my heart, I felt as if she literally put her hand into my chest. I, her hand was above my chest, but energetically, she began to do a kind of a whirlpool around my heart. And I felt it begin to spin. It felt like a big warm soup. And she said, do you feel that? And I said, yeah, I do. You know, it's this warm kind of soupy feeling. And she said, that is your heart energy. And she said, you are giving it to everybody. You're just giving it and mm-hmm. giving it and giving it. And I said, well, yeah, I'm exhausted. I'm, I told you I was toothpaste, flat, you know, gone. And she said, no, no, you have to begin to think differently. As someone who works in this kind of work, you have to think differently And she said, you see how I'm going in a circle? And she said, giving is always a circle because you have to pause at the moment that you're giving and pause for the moment when it's returned to you. And she said, all healing and all work like that is a circuit. And as you give, you wait for the pause, and they they will reflect that energy back to you, and you receive it as you go. And... Honestly, I think that that advice has helped me as someone who works in healing arts more than anything else because you can pause for that moment and let it come back, and you don't have to be a tube of toothpaste. Does that make sense? That's that's beautiful. That's really brilliant. And and as you're speaking it, it reminds me again, you know, we're so lucky to have the forum that, that we have to be able to have these deep conversations with other healers about what happens in these sessions. And, and one of the things that I was thinking about as you were, you were saying that was how often we tend to have uh, groups of clients come in clusters with some of the same issues and, and or how often the people who come to us have same, some of the same challenges or concerns that we have ourselves. And how energetically we kind of connect up like that. And that, that makes a, a great connection with, with the point that you just made. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. I think, you know, we often talk on the forum and amongst ourselves about how certain clients go to certain practitioners, and that's the absolutely perfect place for them to be. But what we Another layer to the conversation is that the clients that come to us are coming for them, but just as equally they're coming to reflect to us some kind of lesson for us. Mm-hmm. And if we can receive that lesson, then the circuit is really working synchronistically. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I I tend to have lots of dreams about um, and, and and thoughts internal thoughts and conversations with Dolores and one of the words that keeps coming up as I think about her and I dream about her and and you know as we continue this work is the word reciprocal and there's something very reciprocal about this work and something about the fact that when you are sitting next to somebody and they are in that deep trance State and you are holding that space and sometimes participating, you know, on the edges and, and you know, and, and 
sometimes more than the edges, there is this reciprocal thing that happens and something about the connection and the circuit. Like, I love that. I, I haven't used the word circuit before, but I think I will now after talking with you, Mary. You know, something about that circuit connection is, is not only helpful for the client, but helpful for us. And the latest information I've got from Dolores herself is this actually helps humanity. Mm-hmm. Tell, tell us more about that. <laughs> Gosh, oh my gosh, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm not really sure. I, every, time, every time I get a little piece of this sort of information, do you remember Dolores saying this because I think about it all the time? Do you remember her saying that they, and she always said they with the little uh, quotes with her fingers in the air, she said the they little- always gave her information uh, a little bit at a time and spoonful by spoonful and, and the last um, sort of communication that I have felt that I've gotten from Dolores, and believe me, I you know I question myself all the time: is this my imagination or is it really her? And I'm I'm very neutral. Sometimes it's like, oh, of course that's her. And sometimes it's like, oh, of course that's my imagination. So I'm I'm right on the line there. But um, the last little bit of information I've gotten from her, I, I can see her sort of grinning and looking out of the the side of her eyes with her fingertips together, you know, that, that, yeah, that, know that gesture one. that she had with her fingertips together and looking at me and nodding and saying, I'm just giving you spoonfuls. I'm just giving you spoonfuls. Oh, God, that's so cute. That's so cute. It really is cute. You know, <clears throat> you know, actually one of the, um, one of the things that I wanted to mention as we were, you know, going into tonight's show and, and I was gathering my information, um, would you mind, Mary? I, I would like I would like to mention this uh blog that was written by one of our colleagues, um, Alini uh, Mandani, who actually lives in the UK and, and she's written um, she's written our most recent blog on our our public site, which is Dolores Cannon, QHHT.com. So the listeners, you might want to go over there and read read some of the blogs over there. And um, Mary's written at least one or two over there. But this is yeah. such an amazing story um, by Alini. And um, are you familiar with this? Had you read this one? Or were you aware of this one, Mary? I'm not sure which one, which one you mean. Well, um, so I'm just going to kind of look at, I have it written in front of me, and I'm not sure I'm going to read it completely, but, but so she has this, um, she, she has this experience with a client, and this happened where, um, and, and what I want to mention, by the way, is that this was Eleni's fourth session, fourth, one, two, three, four. So she wasn't a, a greatly experienced practitioner, but she had had her fourth session, and she had this this client who was a friend of hers. And um, Alini had been experiencing some allergy problems uh, herself, and she'd been having some testing done. And when they went into the session, Alini and her friend, the friend was very generous and very sweet and said, you know, if we get to the healing part, uh, let's see if we can't get healing for you and your allergies. And Eleni was very sweet and said, well, you know, if there's time or if it's okay, et cetera, et cetera. She was um, very concerned about her client getting the best experience. Um, but uh, the client had an excellent session, opened her heart, uh, found that her body was healing, et cetera. And there was a little bit of time left. So Eleni asked permission during this session with her friend, if it was possible to heal her and her allergies. And and she had just had, um, you know, I don't know if you've ever had this done, Mary, but she had uh, or, or known anybody, but she had all those pinpricks on her back, like many, many yeah. pinpricks on her. Mm-hmm. And, and she had, she reacted to every one of them, every single one. And uh, they were all quite concerned about that. And so in the session, the higher self said that uh, they would absolutely 
heal her, meaning the facilitator, Alini. And she could feel energy in the room, and she felt it go through her body. And they encouraged her to touch her own skin. And after a short silence, it said, meaning the higher self through the client, it is gone. And the client, her friend, was deep in her hypnosis and didn't remember anything when it was all over. And what was very, very interesting was that Alini found out that the reason that she had this allergy problem is that she needed to make a change. She needed to change direction in her career and move into this world of healing. And when she went to the hospital, the very next morning, she she goes back to the hospital because her back was a mess with all these allergic reactions. And they couldn't find anything. Her back was completely clear, completely gone. She actually even had shingles in her neck, and they were gone. Everything was gone because Alini, the practitioner, had received the message that she was supposed to have a direction change in her life. And so this is this idea of reciprocal healing. And I yeah. just find that amazing. Yeah, I like that a lot. I mean, I, that's an amazing story, and I, I love it that it was just her fourth session. Right. I mean, right. it's just it it happens exactly when it's supposed to. I, you know, it was funny. I had a really funny session the other day. Um, somebody was, oh, my gosh, where were we? We were, all right, this is going to sound crazy to people, of course, who are just tuning in and don't know that much about QHHT, <laughs> but. We had gone to um, Orion. Um, my client was a volunteer, you know, w- what we call in, in the Dolores work um, a first-wave volunteer. And as so many clients who come to us are, she was exhausted, you know, didn't um, didn't especially want to keep living, you know, I miss my home planet. I don't know what home is, but I know it's somewhere that isn't here. And so we asked... Um, I don't know how weird you want me to get. We went on a spaceship. <laughs> you know, we. I. I said to the two funny little grays that were that were working with her. She wants to go home. She. She doesn't want to just be experimented on and talked to today. She wants to go home. She needs to see her home planet. Um, please take us there. And these two little funny grays who who were actually flesh colored, not you know the typical gray look, but flesh colored, said. We're not allowed to take her home. And I said, oh, yes, you are. We're, we want to go home right now. And so they took her, and they took her to Orion. And there we met her actual mother in that lifetime. Um, who, who She had been a girl who had come down here to help the planet. And um, we also met one of her spirit guides. And I, I, I said, well, can you do some healing on her? Because she's very tired, and she needs her chakras cleared, and blah, 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 you know, you can imagine what I said. So um, this wonderful spirit guide whose name was Ashara said, yes, I will begin to work on her chakras immediately. And in true Dolores fashion, of course, I said, well, can you please talk to me while you do it and tell me what you're doing? Mm -hmm. And there was dead silence. And all of a sudden I felt as if the top of my head had turned into... I don't know, someone had just taken a, you know, screwdriver and was like ramming it into the top of my head, but very gently and very nicely. And I said, (laughs) never mind, I don't have to talk. Because I realized that they were doing the same thing to me that they were doing to her. Uh And this happens over and over and over again in these sessions where, and I think this goes back to our original topic, which is the the, the person who's doing the healing supposedly is actually getting worked on and Mm -hmm. you know i just think that it happens constantly i i think that when we do these sessions we're being worked on as much as the client by their help i think you're right and i think you're right and yeah and it's about you know a lot go ahead go ahead no, I was just saying it's about allowing it, you know. I think we all have the tendency. I mean, I, I'm 
sitting right now in the chair that I sit in when I do my sessions, and I can feel my back, you know, curving towards the bed where I just am throwing all of my energy into the client, just how can I help more, how can I guide you to a better place, how can I do this or that, and I think that they, you know, wink, wink, as Dolores said, know that as we do this, we need the healing too, and we need to um, accept that and allow it in the session. That's probably a lesson for us. Yes, absolutely. And I actually would like to say thank you to um, some of the healers out there who have publicly um, on Facebook, on in articles, on our forum, have talked about uh, being unwell uh, and shared that with others because that's kind of how this show came to be because I'm like, wow, this is happening to many of us. And, and for my own self, I had just gone through this, and you know this very well, Mary. I'd gone through some, some tests and some other things in um, early January, and then I headed down to the N5D conference, amazing conference, the Superpower Conference in beautiful Sarasota, Florida, and gave this speech, and and the whole weekend was amazing and beautiful and wonderful, and I got on the plane to come back home, and I was flying from Tampa to Dallas-Fort Worth, and my seatmate was so sick. She was so sick. And she had, you know, liquid was coming out of her eyes, liquid was coming out of her nose, liquid was coming out of her mouth. And and I was trying, you know, not to be in her space. And um, within about two days, I myself was sick. And uh, so because I am who I am and I do what I do, I start asking the questions, well, what's this mean? You know, what is this about? And as soon as I start to become ill, my own mother becomes ill. And uh, anyone who's followed anything with me and and my mom um, on the radio shows or otherwise lately know that my mom's 89 and she's been slowly, slowly um, coming to the end of her life for a little while now. I truly thought she would go before Dolores, but she has not. And she's still with us. And the same time I got sick, my mother ended up in the hospital with pneumonia. And I was talking to the nurse uh, uh, flat on my back in bed myself. I was sick, talking to the hospital nurse about my mother's condition. And she was telling me the kind of pneumonia that my mother had. And, And the floor nurse was saying, you know, maybe you should go get yourself checked out. I wasn't planning on going anywhere. I was just, you know, in bed waiting for it to be over. But I ended up taking myself to the doctor as well. And um, my doctor said, yeah, we could say that, you know, what you've got is the first stages of pneumonia. And I'm like, well, looky there. And, And what's so interesting about that, of course, is that we really weren't in the same place. We couldn't have shared the same quote unquote germs or virus, but we were both um, having the same challenge at the same time. And there's a lot of different levels to look at uh, about what's going on there. And so for me, what I've been for, for my elderly parents for quite some time is, you know, the go-to person, the answer person, the the person who solves all the problems and takes care of all of the details. And for a good five or six days, I couldn't do anything, sometimes not even answer the phone. I mean, I was flat on my back in bed. And I had many hours to think about why this was happening And um, I tried to see what message was being delivered. And I understand, of course, that part of that is by continuing of letting my mother go and also letting the world turn without me (laughs) having to take care of some of the details, right? right? So. Right, so so there was more than one time that I had to pick up the phone and say, 
well, I'm sorry, whoever, about whatever, concerning whatever. I can't do anything about it because here I am flat on my back in bed. And there was plenty of learning all the way around that happened with with my own um with my own health challenge and I'm still at the tail end of it getting over a cough. But again I wanna I wanna thank so many people. Uh Elena Kapultnik, uh we talked a little bit, you know, she said she thinks it was psychic burnout and uh Michelle Walling herself, we were on the phone. She was just she was sick too and she was dealing with a cough and and there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of learning and and the thing that that gives me the biggest um, the biggest warmth in my heart is that we can be honest about this you know we can talk about this like we are right now on the radio and out there about heck yes we're human and we're right. <laughs> we're dealing with human things just like all of you humans out there and just because yes we um, we talk about being healers doesn't mean we're perfect and it doesn't mean nothing's ever going to come into our life um, that, you know, that, that will make us sick. So we, ha- we have our own things to deal with. And, and that is the reason this show is happening tonight. Yeah, absolutely. And also, God knows, sometimes we just need reminders about what it feels like to be sick. We need reminders. We need to know what that feels like to wrestle with that. God knows. Um, but, you know, something you were saying really made me think about um, seeing this in another light also, which is that sometimes getting sick or getting ill is a protection for us. And, you know, um, I'm thinking, you know, with you, with your cold that you had, your pre-pneumonia, you know, there was some reason why you were protected from, I think, being either in the hospice with your mother or the hospital. I'm not sure. She was in the hospital, you said? She was for about five days. You know, she was in hospice for a while. That's kind of a long story. She kind of fired hospice. It's a long story. But then she ended up in the hospital, and she's back home with care, but not officially hospice just yet because, well, for a lot of reasons. But, mm mm-hmm. But it, but but I think that while she was in the hospital, you, you know, the cold, the the cough, the pre pneumonia protected you from from being, you know, in the hospital at that point. And I do think that sometimes illness comes in, whether you're in the healing arts or you're whatever, as a protection for us to keep us. You know, I'm thinking particularly. It's funny. This is a funny example, but. Um, one of my kids is an athlete. He's a uh, very, very fine lacrosse player. And we've noticed over the years, he's he's a funny kid. He's he's an 11-11 birthday, and he's always been our, our sort of wizard child. And he always seems to have a sort of special layer of protection around him. And we noticed, we have noticed over the years that whenever – he gets a, a kind of a little wound or something that takes him out of the game. We always just see it as a protection. And right now he's recovering from mono, and he's had to miss the first half of his lacrosse season in college, which is, you know, freshman year. It's a big deal. And we just laugh and say, hey, we say to him, you know, you're being protected. There's some reason why you have mono. You will get back on the field eventually, but this is a protection. And so sometimes – Sometimes the, I think our illnesses are to teach us a different kind of lesson than even, you know, the patience of the body or a past life thing. It's Sometimes it's just protection. You know, maybe he would have gotten a concussion or a broken leg or a, you know, whatever. But I, I do think that there are times when we're kept out of the ring, you know, so to speak, the ring of life, just to protect us. I agree. And, um for my own part, I know that, that my mother and I have been so close over the years, and I know for sure, for absolute sure, <laughs> so many different lifetimes um, we've had we've had relationships, and I know for sure that I've been her mother way more than she's ever been mine. And uh, there was a little bit of having, you know, to stop that 
during this particular crisis. It was like, you know, I, I'm doing the best for you and for me by not showing up. And she had to depend yeah. on on some other people. And there was a little bit of um, break in some of the dependency and some growth for both of us during, you know, both of our illness. And yeah. um, it's it's just fascinating. It, you know, when you get to the place where we are, where – and meaning, and I talk about people who do this work, this quantum healing work, and you sit in these sessions and you hear all of these reasons given by the higher self about why things happen. You really have to stop and take stock about when anything happens. You know, perhaps the biggest lesson is just to step back and to consider, you know, what possible message or uh, value in, in whatever it is that you are faced with rather than just trying to fix it immediately. There's something about, I don't know about you, but at least in my early life, if something's wrong, we'll just go fix it. Go fix it, right. take care of it so you can get back to this, you know, this thing that you have this idea of, of what a life should be. And all of that has changed since doing this work. When something happens now, there's a pause, and it's like, well, why is that happening? And I don't care what it is. It could be a flat tire. It could be right. a uh, a hangnail. It could be an illness. It could be, you know, some sort of the other day, not too long ago, actually, there was this fire <laughs> right out the window I'm looking at right now, and I thought this fire was very close, and it wasn't. It was actually several miles away, but it seemed so close because it was so big. And I'm looking at it, and even then I'm like, there's this fire over there, and I'm trying to kind of decode what that all is, you know? And, and What's the deeper meaning? I love that I love that about this work, you know, uh, that no matter what comes into our life, we can look at it and go, well, what's that code for? Yeah, I think it can be a little exhausting to everybody around us, but it's interesting inside our own heads, right? Why mm-hmm. is this happening all the time, constant mm-hmm. interpretation? I, you know, I, I think that um, one of the things you just said I want to pick up on, which is when you said, what is the value? And I think one of the questions that Dolores taught us to ask um, during these sessions that we have is we say to our clients, what does this disease or this illness give you that you wouldn't be getting otherwise? What does this give you permission to receive or what does this give you? And if you do get, because this sometimes can prevent people from getting healed, you know, because finally, you know, being incapacitated or being bedridden or being sick gives them permission to receive love or to receive care or to finally say, I'm sick, I can, you know, take care of myself now, I can get the rest I need, I can, you know, there's a sort of a joke that I th- a lot of women I know make, which is the only time I get any time off is if I get sick. And so <laughs> there's a sense that you need to get sick in order to take care of yourself because you can't do it yeah. in just your daily life. And so I think, you know, I know so many people who whose illnesses serve them on so many levels. And if we don't learn to take care of ourselves in the way that we need to be taken care of, we sometimes have to resort to get sick, especially in this profession, you know, where we are constantly vigilant of other people's health and other people's well-being. You know, we have to be equally vigilant of our own well-being. And I think, you know, the illness can serve us. The illness does serve people. And, you know, my mother used to have this funny expression, which was she would say somebody was professionally sick. And it meant, (laughs) what she meant was, you know, and she would sort of laugh about it, but she would say, you know, you could approach them from a thousand different ways telling them how they could get better. But they didn't want to because they were professionally sick. They were, oh, I went to this doctor and he couldn't fix me, and then I went to that doctor and they couldn't fix me, and then I tried this and tried that. And, you know, they enjoyed 
on some level they were enjoying, you know, they were kind of dining out on their illnesses. And when you meet somebody like that, you know, I, I had a client a few a few years ago who came in. She was about probably 70 years old, very frail, and she'd had Lyme disease for many years. And she was determined not to get better. You know, and I said to her, have you tried antibiotics? Oh, no, I would never try those. You know, there are times when I do think you have to kind of try some traditional stuff. And do, have you tried this? Have you tried that? Oh, no. And, you know, she was very stiff, like a piece of wood. She just actually didn't want to get better. She really just wanted me to ref- reflect back to her that she wasn't uh-huh. going to heal. And, you know, when people are that intransigent, you know, we have to kind of sit back and, and witness that and be with them where they are. And if we can take them a tiny bit, you know, maybe create a little space in there for some other kind of thinking, yes. But, you know, people do sort of fall in love with their own illnesses sometimes. You know, they they really do. And as you're talking, I'm wondering how how personal to get with this, but I think it, it makes a good story. I know I tell many of my clients this, um, especially those who make appointments lately, because I I mentioned to them that, you know, um, my husband and I came here because my parents are in the latter part of their life, and, and my mother in particular. Um, so I, if, if I can be at her side when she passes, I want to be. But my mother has a very interesting story. She was only about two when her own mother became very ill and was sent away. And um, she barely saw her at all between the ages of two and four. And this was in Czechoslovakia and in Germany back in the war, uh, in wartime days in the ni- early 1930s, um, early, late 1930s. 20s and early 1930s and and she um, her her mother died and she was just four and so at the age of four when her own mother died the remaining relatives suddenly showered her with attention and affection hmm. and I think defined her personality absolutely define my mother's personality at age four. Oh, you poor thing. You poor thing who doesn't have a mother. You poor, poor thing. You poor, poor thing. And my talk about reflecting. I think my mother has, has done that um, most of her life. And it took me a really long time to see that she's doing that. And And her own father then died at the age of, of 36. So if you take, wow. if you take my, if you take my grandmother and my grandfather's age and add them up together, I mean, I'm, I think about as that old, right? I mean, and my mother's 89. She, she couldn't conceive of the fact that she would live so long when her own mother died at 24, her own father died at 36. My mother's been dying most of her life because of this, this place, you know, this construct that she found herself in. And I, I didn't see that for a very long time, but, but I see that now and, and I have great compassion for her. And I also, it's interesting, you know, she, she vacillates between being this really sad, pathetic thing and then this amazingly strong, um, uh, a vibrant thing still, you know, in these, in these final and I don't even know if it's days, weeks, months, or, or if she could possibly live another year or two. I, I don't know. But um, it's very interesting when you talk about this idea of, you know, uh, holding on to that identity. And my mother's been that almost my entire life. The first time I remember her telling me she was probably going to go soon, she, I was 12. I was, I was 12. I'm, I'm going to be 55 this summer. Um, you know, it's Candace, just, what, you're, just, what you're saying really, really resonates with um, this thing that I heard from the the um, SC, the subconscious, when I was working with a client, and I, I think I wrote this on the forum, um, 
the subconscious said that healers come into this life, these lifetimes here on Earth in two particular categories. And one is people who hold space for others to heal. So people, doctors, energy workers, whatever, you know, whatever. People who are in the healing arts obviously work to help hold the space for others to heal. But the second category, and this is what makes me think of your mother, is people who come in who become ill in order to heal the people around them. They come in as their their illnesses become teachers. Their problems, their, you know, struggles teach the people around them lessons of patience and lessons of love and unconditional love and understanding and you know, I see very much in what you're saying that your mother came in to bear some of these things to become your teacher. And what a huge gift it is that at age 89, she's still teaching you. And that she, she, she is, really is <laughs> the healer. She is the healer here in in terms of you, you know, and what a testament and what a what an amazing thing to have lived such a long life to give you that because she's healing she's healing you and she's also healing the bloodline as you know because i've become such a believer in this epigenetics that um you know she's healing the bloodline of her mother and father she's healing you and she's healing your children and of course your beautiful new granddaughter who's just arrived <laughs> Um, you know, I think she is a true, she's a real soldier. You know, Mary, thank you for saying all that. And and as long as we're getting personal, maybe I can round out this story by something that's really interesting because Dolores is kind of uh, intertwined with this. You know, when uh, in late 2014, when um, Dolores fell and had her accident, and um, her concussion, which was, you know, the beginning of the end for Dolores, it was, I believe, two days after that my mother fell and shattered her elbow. And so Dolores hits the hospital, and two days later, my mother hits the hospital, and inside my stomach is this churning, strange kind of tornado vortex thing of Dolores and my mother, Dolores and my mother, Dolores and my mother. And Dolores had a much different outlook on life than my mother did. You know, my mother for years and years has been dying. And Dolores was like, I'm fine. I'm going to live to be 100. Um, I would have put all of my money (laughs) on Dolores at the time. And Dolores was the one who ended up passing. And my mother's still here. It's very, very interesting. Um, and uh, just yesterday, I think it was, I was headed to see my mom. And I'm in the car. And my mom has been having dreams and or visitations of Dolores. And it's really funny. She never met her. She never even saw her on a YouTube, nothing. The only thing my mother knows about Dolores is what I've said to her sitting on the sofa telling her about my work and stuff. And she's told me that Dolores has come and talked to her. And I thought that was just so interesting. And and as I'm headed to go see my mom again yesterday, I was thinking to myself about, and I was wondering, I was like, well, if if and when it's time for her to go, I wonder if Dolores would be there for my mom. You know, I mean, I'm sure, you know, my mother's father or, and and my late brother who passed away in 1989, you know, they would probably be there when my mom crosses over. But but my life, and it seems apparently, even my own mother's life, has seemed so wrapped up with Dolores' life. I've been wondering, would Dolores be there? And um, right as I have this uh, thought, the Spinner's song comes on, I'll Be There, which is the same song <laughs> that I played at the, the 2015 yeah. reunion. <laughs> about uh, uh, Dolores being there at the reunion for us, which I just found astonishing. I mean, um, energetically, I, I, I don't know how this is all wrapped up. I, I just find it very, very uh, amazing, these quote-unquote coincidences and these messages that come through in that way. 
Yeah. I mean, it just never ends. You know, as much attention as you can pay to it is as much attention as it deserves. You know what I mean? I mean, everything has meaning. Every every song, every minute, you know, you could drive yourself crazy paying attention to it. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, listen, um, let's switch gears for a minute, Mary. Let me ask you something because Michelle over in the chat room is talking about this idea. And and let me ask you your thoughts on this because, <clears throat> and there goes my cough. Um, so a lot of people around me have been ill. A lot of people across the country have been ill. Michelle got ill very soon after I did. Uh, she says that Greg got sick four days after Michelle and Michelle is wondering about the possibilities of uh, uh, possibly that some of the chemtrail agendas might be dropping viruses on us. What what do you think of that idea? Oh, you're probably not going to like this. <laughs> Michelle, sorry, I don't know. I, um, I, I don't really consider myself part of the planet you know really i i don't pay any attention to the chemtrails i think they're sort of pretty i i look at them and i think you have nothing to do with me so i think it's about what we accept into our reality or not and and that may sound kind of silly and childish and so forth and so on you know i i think about sherry wild who i was lucky enough to sit next to a dinner a couple of years ago at a um at a UFO conference maybe, or I can't even remember what it was, but um, she just said she looks at the chemtrails and says, you know, you're not part of my reality, and they disappear. And, mm-hmm. you know, I I don't accept it that anything, you know, I'm, I don't know, maybe I'm just crazy. I, I don't let anything get to me. I try to, I, I just look at the clouds and say, you're not going to make me sick. I know they're there. But I just am so stubborn. I just say no. <laughs> no, 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 no. And so I think that, you know, if I can lend some of that stubbornness to Michelle and to Greg, please take it. I refuse to let anything affect me. I try to be very autonomous in terms of what I allow into my field and what I don't allow into my field. So, yes, I think I think anything can affect you. I mean... You know, um, but other things might affect me. It might be something else. When one of my children is sick, I get get very upset. A cloud doesn't necessarily bother me, but other things do. So I think it's about what you are looking for in a way. Daryl Anka, you know, he talks about permission slips, one of my favorite ideas, the idea that we, we allow certain permission slips to heal and we allow certain permission slips to get sick. You know, um, people will get sick over politics. Oh, Donald Trump makes me sick. Oh, Bernie Sanders makes me sick. Oh, this makes me sick. That makes me sick. But just as just as um, likely, something heals you. Oh, eating green vegetables on Tuesdays and Thursdays heals me. You know, um, Reiki healed me. Um, antibiotics healed me. So whether something makes you sick or makes you well, it's it's whatever you permit. And so, mm-hmm. you know, that would be kind of my response to that. Um, having not met Michelle or Greg, if I knew them, I'd probably be a little more tactful. But <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're wonderful! Actually, um, sure you know, I'm I, sure they're wonderful. But I, you know, if I knew them, I might not want to say that <laughs> out loud. You know, actually, I'm, I'm really glad that you did because there's uh, what's what's great about this show and in 5 e and and all of us is that we can talk about this stuff because I think if you know we are we're all doing the best that we can always we're always doing the best we can and I actually referenced the same thing about Sherry Wilde that you do in her book she talks about um, I think she's out for a walk and and she sees sees the um what what she sees as a, a chemtrail up in the air and she gets upset and then she just has this feeling that she doesn't want it and she's like absolutely watching this plane and the whole thing disappears and suddenly she thinks her thoughts might have just eliminated that pilot and and I mean and she goes into this vortex of um, 
uh, wondering what happened there and, and how is it that we create our reality and, and, and our thoughts and all of that. And, and she, she talks about that brilliantly in, in her book. And then in the chat room, Michelle is now talking about the fact that, and this is true, that, um, you know, she talks about meaning. Um, uh, Sherry Wild talks about, you know, the idea of the ETs being positive and everything. And then she has, she has this really awful experience where she gets very, very sick and she's, she's feeling poisoned and, and she is having, she's reeling, you know, she's having to deal with these, um, these topics or these energies that she had previously claimed would have no power over her. And these are these really interesting places to be human, you know? I mean, we can make these declarations and we can say all of this. We could say, well, what you believe and and you create your own reality and all of this. But I think we don't understand a lot of the weaving and a lot of the complexity that goes on here. I mean, we we have better understanding I think, than we have had in the past. But we don't have full and complete understanding. And and I kind of, um, it worries me, or not worries me, but when people say that they completely understand, I, I tend to think, how is it possible, if you're a human, that you completely understand? I mean, it's part of, I think it's part of the game, part of the reason we're here, that we can't understand every facet of what's going on here. Oh, yeah, of course. And, you know, I'm going to go back to what I said at the very beginning of our conversation, which was how incredibly obnoxious it is when somebody who's not feeling sick to somebody who's feeling sick, oh, I I just, that's just not my reality. You know what I mean? I mean, that's, you know, that's very annoying. And I think, I don't know, it's just so hard when you're not feeling well to have any idea other than my body hurts. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I, I I feel so awful about poor Sherry. So she's going through this now? Well, she was. I know she's better. Um, I know she's going to be speaking um, pretty soon um, at um, the UFO conference, and I know that she's better, but uh, I haven't spoken to her directly for for a while. She has been in recovery, I think, she had, she made some sort of, as I'm remembering, some sort of turnaround after connecting up with Anelia Benz. I think she was getting ready to just kind of give up, and um, suddenly um, she decided that wasn't happening for her anymore. Um, very, and, and very human. Yeah, and Mich- Michelle's saying, too, that about 50% of the people here got flu over the last month. I hadn't even thought of the flu. I know. It's, it, it, what, what's interesting about this is just how many people have gotten sick at the same time. I really wonder about these things. I mean, I, I don't have an answer, and I'm not saying that you do or that anyone does. I think that we can just think about it and, and wonder. I mean, at least we can think about it in different ways than we used to, right? Oh, my God, absolutely. I mean, I w- uh, you know, when I think about the Tuskegee experiments or, um, mm-hmm. you know, there are so many times when human beings have just simply been experimented on. And, you know, we go back to Daralanka where I think, like, I prefer not to think about that. I, I, I don't <laughs> think that that's my role in this world right now is to dwell on man's inhumanity to man. I mean, I... It's so unbearable for me to think about, you know, the person who gets in an airplane and has chemicals in those tanks and sprays them into the sky. I just can't bear to think about it. And so, you know, I'm sure you could find a guest who would come on and be happy to, you know, go into that stuff, but that is just not my way. I I can't do it. It's too painful for me to... um, consider that people would try to make other people sick or spread disease or whatever. I just, I, I can't be a part of that, you know. I can't even think it. I, I can hardly stand yeah. that. It, you know, I think, you know, I would consider myself very much a first waiver. And, you know, the thing that Dolores 
teaches us about first waivers is that we don't understand meanness. And, mm-hmm. you know, um, I, that would be something that's that's just hard for me to do. I, I don't understand. I even, my husband's always getting mad at me. I leave my purse open in my, in my, uh, <laughs> the grocery store I'll throw my purse in the cart and go to like four aisles over and he'll say you left your purse in the cart I'm like well if somebody needs the money I guess they'll take it I don't know (laughs) you know um it it makes you think about all kinds of things like the plague or or um you know what was it the, the 1927 or 24 you know influenza epidemic or whatever I mean what's going on there how do you explain those things I, you know, I don't know. I mean, or you think about the Holocaust. How does that all happen at once? You know, uh, mm-hmm. you're you're reaching into. You didn't tell me we'd be talking about this. I'd have to think <laughs> a little bit. Um, but I'll tell you what, Candace. I'd really love to go back just for a second to the idea of illness sure. and healing and the 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 roles that they play because there was something I really wanted to. Um, make sure we talked about, which is the idea that you can be very, very sick and even even transition or die, as we call it, and still be healed. So that was something I really wanted to make sure we talked about. Um, I I think think that's that's, that's a great way to end the show. So let's talk about that. Absolutely. So you're telling our listeners about this idea that you don't necessarily have to continue to live to be healed. Is that right? Yeah, and I think, you know, I think this is something I originally read in Carolyn Mace years ago. Um, I've forgotten which book it was, but, you know, this, or maybe it was Louise Hay, but uh, this idea that, you know, you can be sick and sick and sick and sick and sick for years. You can be cured from the sickness, and that's great, but you can also, you can also be not you can also be not cured from the illness but you can die healed because healing is about coming to terms with um something spiritual something um you come back into balance some kind of understanding of life and love and whatever the lesson is you need to learn and so just because a person dies or transitions from that particular mechanism or illness it does not mean that you aren't healed because not only can you be healed spiritually the people around you can come into some kind of understanding and some very sweet place where you know the transition can be a moment of profound healing for everybody and so i i just think that's really important to emphasize is that healing does not necessarily mean living forever or for a longer period. I think that I think that you know that's a wonderful way to come to kind of the end of our our show tonight is to talk about that in that way because you're right it's not always about continuing physical existence in this body. Healing can come in other kinds of ways and I don't know if you have had clients yet who have passed over um, who've come to you with uh, terminal illness, but I know that that I have, and, and we talk about this on the forum, and, and what we have to do is sort of set aside this idea that success is always the continuation of the physical body and life because it's exactly what you just said. There, there's a different way of approaching understanding and looking at the idea of healing. And I absolutely, as I'm thinking about it, two, three, four, four different clients that I can think of just off the top of my head over the years who came to see me because they were, they were very, very ill, but they let go in peace and with some resolution and understanding of what was going on. And even though they died, they died with a sense of healing. Absolutely. It's funny. I keep thinking of this moment in um, one of my favorite movies, Little Big Man. I don't know if you ever saw it, where Chief Dan George, 
keeps going up to the um, high place in the mesa to die, and he keeps saying, it's a good day to die, and then he lies there for a while, and he still doesn't die. You know, he's like, it's a good day. You know, and um, that whole idea of being perfectly happy with your own death, you know, that your own death yeah. comes as a welcome, a welcoming, um, is is absolutely fine. The death is not the ultimate victor in some way, but a friend, and I think yeah. that's okay. Yeah. You know, it's funny you say that. So, so I imagine I'm replacing that scene with my own mother in her 40s, her 50s, her 60s, her 70s, her 80s, and maybe even now in her 90s. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Absolutely. <laughs> maybe that Absolutely. isn't funny, but um, I've got to find humor in there somewhere, right? Yep, you do, and and that's the way to go. I mean, you know, I remember when my own mother, my mother was dying, and at one point my sister said to her the night before she died, are you dying? Like, you know, like, are you dying? And my mother nodded and smiled this very enthusiastic smile. You know, she found the whole process fascinating and exciting. And, you know, she never said another word, but that was her last thing was, yeah, I'm dying. It's really fun. And um, I think, you know, the the victor is not is not death. The victor is, is our attitude towards where the next, the next adventure. Mm-hmm. Well, Mary, you know, as I go through what I'm going through, I think about Dolores a lot, and I think about you, and I think about your mother a lot, too. And um, I want to thank you so much for joining me tonight on this show. It's been an amazing conversation with you, um, and I think this is a great place to sort of wrap things up so i want to thank everyone who's tuned in and to listen to tonight and all of you out there who were listening to an archived version of this show in the future so mary how can people find you how can listeners find you in the future maybe just have a, a quantum healing hypnosis session with you in the maryland area how can they find you uh, my website is um, www.healingacrosstime.com, and I'm in Annapolis, Maryland, and I'm happy for people to check out my website and give me a call or write me. Um, and that's and I'm also on Facebook. Uh, my page is Healing Across Time, and um, I would love to hear from from anyone who'd like to work with me. And you know, Candace, thank you so much for inviting me on the show. I love talking to you, and um, you always have a f- wonderful topic. And you, you let me um, explore my own imagination and my own <laughs> ideas so freely, and I really appreciate that. Oh, Mary, it's always a great time talking with you. As well, I really appreciate you taking time out of your Friday evening to chat with me tonight about this very important topic. So thank you so much for being right. with me tonight. Thank you. I do. I do okay. appreciate it. Sure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So again, I'd like to remind those of you interested in quantum healing or who are looking for a practitioner of Dolores' method, or if you're already a practitioner, you can find a robust support community to join at DoloresCannonQHHT.com. That's DoloresCannonQHHT.com. And you can find out more about my own practice of quantum healing at NewEarthJourney.com. And I want to thank our great friends, um, Greg Prescott and Michelle Walling again at N5D for joining us in the chat room tonight in the show and supporting this this show tonight and for everything that you do for us and the planet. And for all of you out there, until next time, sleep well, be well, and many blessings to you all. Good night. <laughs>